Hi there. My name is Brett Mustard, and I work on the sales team here at Synology. Today, I'll be covering the backup and disaster recovery portion of our Synology Solution Seminars. We're going to take a look at best practices regarding using this software, and specifically, how to protect that data living on your NAS. Let's take a look at some of the applications we have that can help you do this. In this diagram, we're looking at our company's file server. This is the spot where everyone is storing and accessing their files on the network. One of the best things we can do for a file server is add in local redundancy by implementing a high availability server cluster. Next, we'll look at disaster recovery, having an offsite copy of your data, which you would be able to restore to in the event of a critical data loss at your company. And finally, we'll take a look at backup, having a secondary copy of that data that you can easily restore to when you need it. We've designed applications for all of these situations, and they're all completely free of charge and ready to install right out of the box with your NAS. Let's take a look at each of these individually. So again, for local redundancy, you'll be using high availability. Snapshot replication is for disaster recovery and providing remote redundancy. And Hyper Backup is our multi-version backup tool that's highly configurable and something that most of you will probably be pretty familiar with. We'll start out with high availability. These are two servers that are identical twins of each other. They're configured exactly the same way, and they're connected by a heartbeat connection, which is behind a single virtual IP on the network. So when you're using high availability, you have an active server and a passive server. The active server is the primary, and it's handling all of the required responsibilities on your network. The passive server is simply waiting to automatically take over that role if there's ever any issue. So if something happens to the active server and it ends up going offline, the passive server will see that it's gone offline and immediately resume its responsibilities with minimal downtime, usually just a few seconds. And again, all of this happens behind a single virtual IP on your network. This means all of the PCs and users in your environment will most likely be unaware that a potentially critical server failure has just occurred on the network. This is a great way to keep people working and protect against downtime and lost data. Those of you with application servers in your environment, like a chat server or a web server, and those of you that are using virtual machines in your environment, this is a great way to keep everything online and working and protect against data loss. So let's take a look at a quick visual representation of what high availability looks like. So here's an overview of our environment. On the left, we have all of the PCs. In the middle, that network switch represents our network. You can see our active and passive server on the right, connected by that heartbeat connection. And on the far right, those cylinders represent the hard drives on those machines. So this is what happens when someone uploads data to the server. We can see it pass along through the network to the active server. As soon as it gets there, a copy of that data is made and sent to the passive server and to its hard drives. Once that's been completed, an acknowledgment gets sent all the way back through those servers and back to that original PC. That acknowledgment is letting that PC know that that data has been uploaded successfully. So the reason we're looking at this is because of the heartbeat connection and how critical it is to performance. So let's take a look at that. The heartbeat in this diagram is represented by the green line. That represents the cable, or rather in this case, the connection between those two servers. This, as I was demonstrating in the previous slide, is how we're keeping that data synced between these two devices. An important consideration to make is that the speed or the bandwidth of that heartbeat connection needs to be the same or larger than the speed of your network. So for example, if you have 10 gig in your environment, that heartbeat needs to be 10 gig at a minimum. Or if you have a gigabit connection in your environment, implementing 10 gig is still a great way to make sure that you don't have any performance issues through that heartbeat connection. Another thing that can greatly boost your performance is using SSDs. Whether you're filling your device entirely with SSDs and creating an all flash array or implementing a read write SSD cache for that hot data, um, these are both great ways to boost that performance. Another tool you can use to increase performance is link aggregation using multiple ports on the back of the device to boost its network performance. It's important to note that that needs to be set up before these two units are linked together in high availability. Now, the subject of this video is talking about best practices. So ideally, these two devices would be linked together with a direct connection, mainly because it's a single point of failure and a very clean way of connecting the two devices. But you do have the option of doing this over a switch if you need it. So if you have two buildings and these servers are gonna be in two different locations that are connected, that would be possible. In order to do that, you're going to need to create a VLAN to make sure there aren't any conflicting IPs in your network. You'll need to make sure you have very low latency in your environment. You'll also need to make sure that you can support at least 500 megabits per second of bandwidth 
and that switch must support both uh, multicast and jumbo frame. So if all of these are ready to go in your environment, you can safely deploy a high availability setup using a switch. Although again, it is recommended to have a direct point to point connection between the two devices. One other thing to point out is that sometimes in these situations, a split brain error can occur. A split brain error is basically the two servers becoming disassociated and thinking that they're both the active server. This can cause all sorts of problems. For example, multiple different instances of the same data. An easy way to unwind this and fix it is to disconnect all of the cables, which will automatically put the two units into safe mode. Safe mode is going to block that external IP address. It's also going to block the IP of the active and passive server. So everything is offline at that point. Once everything has been unplugged and both units are in safe mode, you can directly connect your computer to one of the servers. At this point, you can log in and take a look around and figure out which of the servers has the correct version of your data. From there, you'll know which server you'd like to be your current active server, and you can unbind the two devices and then recreate the cluster. This is basically unwinding the split brain error, recognizing which unit has the current version of your data, and then resyncing the two devices. One thing you can do to prevent this is implement a quorum server. A quorum server is basically an anchor in your environment. This could be your DNS server. It's something both the active and passive server are going to ping and wait for its response to figure out their roles. For example, if your network goes down and both servers are completely offline, they're going to start pinging that quorum server. And if they're not getting that response, the passive server is going to realize that the network has gone offline and that it does not need to take on the role of the active server. So setting up a quorum server is a great check-in for both servers to make sure that they're keeping their assigned roles and protect against split brain errors. So that's been a look at how we can handle local redundancy with a high availability cluster. Now let's talk about backing your data up offsite. So for disaster recovery, you'll be using snapshot replication. And for that backup, you'll be using hyper backup. Let's dig into these two pieces of software a little bit more. So we have two pieces of backup software that can send your data off site. What I'm going to talk about now are the key differences between these two pieces of software when it's appropriate to use each of them. Let's start out with snapshot replication. So snapshot is a point in time backup software. It's going to take an exact snapshot of your data at certain increments during the day, whether this is once a day or you can set it to run every five minutes. It's going to give you a restore point that you can roll back to should you need that data. Now, the most important thing to point out is you're creating an exact copy of the data. If you have 10 terabytes in your headquarters, you're going to have 10 terabytes on your disaster and recovery unit offsite. The good thing about this is that it's an instantly accessible version of that backup. So if you have an emergency, let's say that a pipe bursts in your server room and your server is ruined, you can point your network at that offsite server. And again, it's an exact copy of the data. So you can instantly access that data and bring your company back online immediately. Hyper Backup is a much more traditional piece of backup software. It's highly configurable. So whether you're backing up to a USB device, another NAS, a server that supports rsync, um, or a cloud account, we realize many, many of our customers are integrating with cloud accounts. All of these are options as your backup target for hyper backup. And again, this is a more traditional backup. So this is something that you'll need to restore should you need to access it. Now that comes with a number of advantages. You can use things like cross version deduplication and compression to help save on size. You can also encrypt your backups to help protect that data. You also have the option of backing up the packages and the configuration of your Synology NAS. This means that that data is going to be included in your backup file. This will make it really easy to set back up if you're ever reconfiguring your NAS device. So the key distinction between these two pieces of software. With snapshot replication, you have an exact copy of your data that's instantly accessible in the event of a disaster. Hyper Backup is a much more traditional piece of backup software that gives you a lot of options as to how you'd like to back your data up. Now these two pieces of software share one distinguishing feature. They're both going to be backing up over the internet. This means that your internet service provider is going to be the bottleneck in sending your backups to that offsite location. What we're looking at right now is a pretty standard business internet plan in the US currently. So that's a 50 meg plan as it's, as it's usually advertised. So that 50 megs is not symmetrical. That means it's 50 megs down and five megabits per second up. So the upload speed is what's gonna be sending that back up elsewhere. 50, or excuse me, five megs up shakes out to about 640 kilobits per second. So in this example, we have a two terabyte backup 
and that's going to turn into about 40 days to back that up with that standard five megabit upload speed. That is way too long to send your data off site. So we have a couple of great options to help you accomplish this. One way you can do this is by bringing that backup unit on site to use your local network to copy that backup. So again, you're gonna bring it in house, you can connect it to your local network, choose that as your backup target, and then once that backup has been seeded onto the second unit, you can just ship that unit to your secondary location and then relink the backup. Another way to do this that's very easy is to export that onto a hard drive. So let's say in that two terabyte example, um, you wanted to send this to your second location that's the backup. You could connect a two terabyte USB hard drive, export the data onto that drive, ship it to the offsite location, copy it onto that secondary unit, and then relink the backup task. So let me jump into a demo and I'll show you exactly what that looks like and just how easy it is to get that data offsite. Okay, so here we are logged into our Synology NAS. So let's take a look at Hyper Backup. And again, in this scenario, we're gonna be sending our backup from site A over to site B. So site A is our headquarters, we'll say that's on the west coast, and site B is a location over on the east coast, and we want that to house our backups for us. So here in Hyper Backup, you can see I've run this backup task a couple of times, but let's go ahead and create a new task so you can see this process start to finish. So we'll say new data backup task. So now it's gonna show us a number of locations that we can choose um, to save that backup. Down here, you'll see all of those cloud services I mentioned a moment ago. But for today's purposes, let's look at remote NAS device. We'll choose that and say next. So from here, we're gonna export that onto a USB device. So we'll click down here, this bottom option, export to a local shared folder, or in our case today, to a USB drive. So we'll choose in our dropdown list, these are all of the shared folders available, but there you'll see right in the middle, our USB demo backup. So we'll choose that and that's automatically going to create demo NAS3 um, as the name of our backup directory folder. And that's demo NAS3 because I've created this task two times previously. So now we'll go ahead and click next. And we have the option of choosing that folder we wanna back up. In our case today, we're gonna to choose documents and next. Now we have the option to back up those various packages that are installed on our Synology. So rather than reconfiguring these later, if there's ever any issue, we have a backup of Active Directory Server and DNS Server. Those will both be saved in our backup. We'll click Next. And now we can enable notifications on this task and also enable compression to help save on size. So we'll go ahead and click Apply. And Export Now. Great. This is exporting. That should be done in just a moment. So now that that's completed, we're going to eject our USB device and ship that over to Site B, our offsite location on the East Coast. So we'll locally connect that to the Synology NAS and then copy the data from our USB device into a shared folder. We'll call that Backup Restore. So now that backup file is in the Backup Restore folder on our location at Site B. Now back at Site A, we're going to relink that task to the offsite unit at site B. So let me show you how to do this. So now we have our Synology NAS3, that's that backup that we just created, and we wanna relink that task. So we'll go ahead and click on relink now. So from here, we'll enter in that external IP address of the server, whether or not we wanna enable encryption, then we can log in with the username and password of that server. Once that's done, we can click on this dropdown and it's going to show all of the shared folders that are available on the server at site B. So in our case, we saved it into Backup Restore, that shared folder. So we would go ahead and choose that folder and it's gonna show in the directory demo NAS3 because that's that current version. So it'll alert us that yes, there's a backup directory file saved in here if you'd like to use that to restore and we'll say yes. So from there, once we click next, then we're gonna confirm the folder that we've selected. In our case, that's gonna be that documents folder. After that, we'll click next and it's gonna show the packages that we've selected. So again, that'll be Active Directory and DNS Server. We can choose those to restore as well. So after that, it's gonna ask us to set up a schedule for how regularly we'd like those backups to run and also if we would like to enable rotation on the backups. So after a certain point, let's say it's six months, it's gonna start cycling out those oldest backups. After that, we'll click Next and Apply and it will let us know that we've successfully relinked our backup task. It is as easy as that. So this has been a quick look at how we handle backup and redundancy. To quickly touch on everything we talked about today, for local redundancy, it's high availability. For disaster recovery and remote redundancy, you'll use snapshot replication.
And that multi-version backup, much more traditional, restorable backup, is hyper backup. I'll point out too that all three of these pieces of software should be used with each other to take advantage of each other's strengths. I'll also point out that all three of these pieces of software are absolutely free and ready to be installed right out of the box with Synology. No monthly fees, no additional fees. And that's pretty much it for the video. I'd like to thank all of you for taking the time to go through this seminar with me today. If you'd like any more information on any of the services I talked about today, please visit www.synology.com.